I don't know. We're don't not putting bring the fucking we're hat not back. Putting the hat back here. He's already asked him. He's like, go get the hat out there. I, yeah. I have I have a good idea. I, I didn't have time because I thought of this like at three in the morning last night when I was writing my fifteen pages of notes for this podcast. How many notes did I oh sorry, I went twenty pages this week. Um so I don't but first I, of all, I don't even know what you could write I twenty pages put, on in this world of sports right I now. put <laughs> My heart and soul. No, I get it. I and get I it. bleed. I get it. But... Sweat and cry for this podcast. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I put a ton of effort in this shit. All right. Now. I didn't know. I thought were... of a great idea last night. I haven't, read, I haven't written 20 pages of anything in my life. I am a hard worker. Okay. <laughs> hard also, work. hard work. You're like Floyd Mayweather. Hard work, dedication. You're just going to start going around yelling that everywhere you go as, with your posse. As my dad would say, hard yes. work, smart work. That's right. But. I, when doing this last night, thought about it, and I wanted to come up with this because I wanted a way to shout out my boy, Dante DiVincenzo, who's been killing it for the Knicks, even though he didn't play fantastic in Game 4. And I was trying to think of, you know, uh, an award or something I could give to him. And so if you have a better name for it, you can tell me. But I'm looking, I want to make a, a wall of fame here at the podcast, and we put you know, the guy's faces on it as we add to the, it's the grit wall of fame or like, you know, the guys who are gamers, they're gym rats. Well, Dante you DiVincenzo can be the second one up there. Big Dog is going to be the first Big one Big Dog's there. not allowed on there. I yes. thought you were going to say yes. Brooklyn. Brooklyn is going to, oh. we're going to have a picture of oh, Brooklyn, yeah. the, the Brooklyn the dog, your dad, the, and then, the grit and then wall Dante. Of fame. Yes, Brooklyn's so, the grittiest dog to ever live. We're going to get her on the podcast. Now, soon. if you... If you're a if you're a dickhead like Patrick Beverly, you don't get to you, just because you're gritty doesn't mean you get on the wall wall of fame. All right, you gotta have specific characteristics, right? Like first one in, last one out, right? High IQ guy, gamer, gym rat, all those type crafty. Okay, there's a whole number of things. They don't have to be white, okay, but they do got to be gritty. And so we're gonna create that. We're gonna put it back here, starting next time. And the first one is gonna be. Dante DiVincenzo and the and the Chihuahua Brooklyn. By the way, I was watching the episode of Curb last night where they where Larry thinks that the girl's Chihuahua is a rat. Oh yeah. And then he takes the exterminator to the to the show of Greece and and they they think it's a rat. He stomps the Chihuahua to death. <laughs> it's a pretty bad pretty bad scene. All right. Anyway, gotta love Curb enthusiasm. Okay, we'll jump into some sports stuff. Let's do before I go to my business of the week. Give me the best thing you saw this week's in the sports world or out of the sports world because I kind of have an yeah, idea. Yeah, no, going we're gonna we're gonna fill people in a uh, little behind the scenes look to the podcast here. Big dog for Mother's Day, you decided to go out and play pickleball with your mom. She requested your dad go out there and play, so big dog was out there. I mean, looking like a million bucks, and Dylan said. Oh, he's never won a point off me. This and that and the other. Let me tell you folks something, okay? Big Dog being, I'm not going to age him, but he's in his 60s, okay? The guy looked like Sampras out there. I mean, my God, just smoking forehands. And then and Dylan did Dylan did get pretty much everything back 99% of the time. However, there is one point where Big Dog smoked the forehand, then came into the net and finished with like a, a volley down the line, was so pumped up, just tossed a racket and walked off the court. It was like, it, it legitimately looked like his idol, um, Pete Weber, the bowler, where he just started screaming. You didn't know what he was saying, but he just started screaming, who do you think you are? I am, yep. you know, and pretty much pretty much uh, quit. I don't know if he played with y'all anymore. No, he, he did just, not come back He just out. went inside. He went it inside. was very humid. And then the other great thing, we always want to give you a look behind the scenes of Big Dog's great studio. After several months uh. of a layoff, I have very exciting news. The great Shimako is is back. The great Shimako is back. We will eventually have him on the podcast. He writes lyrics like, I mean, he writes lyrics that you can't even say on YouTube, but the man is, uh, he's got a cult following in San Antonio. I think he's getting ready to take over the world. Oh, is he? Shimako. Shimako and Big cult Dog. Cult following is a strong cult, statement. Cult following. There. He does Shimako. spit fire, but... <laughs> yeah. His lyrics are really something. By the way, Bailey, was was that song you were reading us, those lyrics, those amazing lyrics before we went live here, was that in English? Like, is he is he rapping in English or is he translating that to Spanish? Because he's, he's, 
He's made the switch to English. I, I don't I, know if I necessarily like that. You know, it, it's a bold move. See if it pays off for him. Yeah, but very bold. I will, I will say one, and I know this Turner was going to use this as his best thing he saw this week, but there was one thing in the sporting world that we watched together yesterday, which was the Bramas, just so we can touch on the UFL right now anyway and get it out of the way. The Bramas were down. They looked out, and they pulled the bum Quentin Dormandy. They pulled him, and they put in the savior, Kevin Hogan, all six foot three of them with that luscious, beautiful mustache. And he came into the game and immediately took him on a 19-play, 11-minute drive down the field. And yes, we were yelling at our TVs, why the fuck are you taking so long? There was a challenge. It was there like was- watching paint dry. I mean, it was the slowest drive you've ever seen for a team that was down nine points. It was, but they knew all along they were going to get that touchdown, which mm-hmm. they did. Mm-hmm. They punched it in, and then in the UFL, the beautiful UFL, we got a three-point play. Yep. And from the 10-yard line, you better believe Kevin Hogan dropped a dime. They caught it in the end zone. And then on the ensuing kickoff, they they forced a fumble, recovered it, and then I f- believe his name is Ryan Santoso, the kicker for the Bramas, who was off the street. Yeah, looks very pure of San Antonio. I feel like he's... He's from town somewhere. He, he was looks like he, you know, he, he gets his enchiladas in a couple times a week. He smoked smoked the kick downwind. I mean, it was what fifty one yard kick would have been good from seventy. It was good from seventy. Put his back yeah. into it. He was he was you know straight off his couch picking lint out of his belly button, and he came straight into that field and he he punched that kick through like a like a beast, and they won the game. And now they are one game, I believe, away from clinching a playoff spot in the UFL. So that's the best three things we saw this week. There's a trio for you. Oh, yeah. Real quick, we'll go through this. The San Antonio Business of the Week. Shout out to Teca Molina, which is a very solid Mexican food restaurant that I've been going to for a long time. The original one is off San Pedro, which is still there. Mm-hmm. A little bit outside Classic. the loop. Classic place. Great chips. Uh, they're like they're like distinct, right? Like those are like distinct. They taste like you're eating Fritos almost. That's exactly what it tastes yeah. like. They're and they're yeah. and they're really really good, fried like fried Fritos though, like hot fried Fritos with lots of salt. And uh, they got some good salsa there too. But they're they got like very unique food in the sense that like I don't think they are they're the inventor of like the bean roll and the bean cup essentially right like they have a, it seems that well at least down here, here in san antonio are, yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah. like they got a, it's like a fried roll of corn tortilla with like refried beans in the middle and then they've got bean cups which are like these little fried cups with bean and cheese they have a they have a literally a thing called a fried cheese where it's literally a fried cheese fried piece of cheese it's phenomenal anyway there's one off Redmond as well. Very, very, very good Mexican food. They got good enchiladas, good chalupas, nachos, everything you could want there. Go to Tech and Molina on San Pedro, or there's one off Redmond and, and Harry Wurzbach in that little shopping center over by Longhorn Cafe. Support San Antonio local businesses as we are in our quest to get to 5,000 subscribers, and we will continue throwing out businesses every week to support local San Antonio businesses. All right. We're going to jump into a lot of sports here today. Had, you know, I know you love NBA playoffs, but that is the prevalent thing going on here. And there's been some great series going on. You know, we had all three series going into game four tied at 2 1. Um, I believe we have now two tied at 2 2, and the other two are played tonight. So we actually have a potential for four series to go into game five all square at 2 2. We'll see how the games play out tonight. With the Mavericks and the Thunder, and then the Heat, or I'm sorry, the Celtics and the Cavs. Let's start because I think this is the most compelling series. Let's start with the Pacers and the Knicks in the East. The Pacers win game four in dominating fashion last night, 121 to 89. Now the Knicks took games one and two. Game three, controversial finish. A couple of calls went the Pacers' way. Lots of controversy early in the series in favor of the Knicks. Yeah, I would say that game one and three are kind of like washes in in the sense of what it was game one where he kicked it, right? Where they called the right. kick and it was going to be a fast break layup the other way probably. Right. So, and then, um, yeah, controversial calls for sure. And the, and the Knicks, just their whole team's hurt. So, I mean, it you know, it could go, it could go anywhere, anyway at this point because if OG doesn't come back, which I don't think he is, hamstrings, you just can't. Yeah. You just can't be explosive 
with a um, hamstring that's bothering you. And typically, you're going to go into the game and you're just going to re-aggravate it almost immediately. So their best chance probably is hoping they can somehow win two out of three, which which who knows? If Brunson scores 40 and DiVincenzo scores 30 like he has been, you know, they could uh, end up winning two out of three still. You never know. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think um, they just need to re- rest him and hope. As you bring him back, he's probably going to re-aggravate it. If you somehow get through the series, you know, when he gets a – you know, misses game one. You just maybe throw game one out of these. I mean, these are. They, I mean, you can't really do that. But you just got to try to get them back for the Celtics series. If oh, sorry, I'm already shooing in the Celtics. Well, they, they guys, are. But they're uh, going to win that series. They're going yeah. to win that series. We're so, going to touch on them in a second. Yeah, but, but no, I mean, I agree. I guess the one thing I, I don't. He's been ruled out for game five, which is tomorrow. And by the way, I want to touch on a few things in this series because it is the probably the most fun and compelling series, even though. I do believe, and I agree, the kickball was a huge call. You know, if that isn't called, if that's called the non kickball, the Pacers have the ball. There's still a minute to go. It's a tie game. We don't know how that plays out. Um, I, think there's, I, I think there was even... I, no, because Di Vincenzo four, hit 40, the three with 44 like, seconds left on the kick? No, I think, I think there was, gonna, was a minute. Because oh, okay. DiVincenzo, that, that possession lasted another like 10 seconds, and DiVincenzo hit a three right at the end of the shot clock buzzer. I could be wrong, but I remember yeah, 54 whatever. seconds. It's around, in my mind. around it's a around, minute. It's around a minute. Yeah. We don't know how it plays out. It would have been advantage Pacers because they would have had the ball. You know, it, the, the the Pacers got a number of favorable calls at the end of game three, and it it still took a Ryan Nimhard 32 foot three at the bu- shot clock buzzer that was basically a prayer to go in for them to win the game. Regardless, I I, I want to touch on Rick Carlisle because after game two. He came out, and, and I get it. That one call was a big missed call, and, and but that's less on the officials, in my opinion. And I talked about this on a video after that game. That's less on the officials because they're going to miss calls. It's more on the challenge system. Like you should be able to challenge whether a ball is kicked or not if they call a kick ball. Yeah. You can only challenge right now in the current system. You can challenge foul calls if they're called. A foul call is called. You can challenge whether it is a foul or not. You can challenge a goaltend, and you can challenge who the ball is out of bounds on. That's the only three things you're allowed to challenge. That makes no sense, right? I mean, if you're allowing people to challenge foul calls, that's a subjective thing that you're going to look at video by, like, and it's a judgment call, then you should be able to challenge anything because everything could be a judgment call at that point. Yeah. They don't allow the challenge of the kickball. Huge call. I get it. However, Rick Carlisle comes out after game two when they lose, when there was no controversial calls. They just got beat. And they got beat after OG Ananobi and Mitchell Robinson went out. And he said something like, you know, small market teams deserve a shot too. And I like Rick Carlisle, but that was fucking stupid to say. Because, first of all, the Knicks are the biggest market team in the NBA. They haven't won, a, they haven't won an NBA championship in 38 years. Okay, so that, that, that whole hypothesis is null and void right there. They're not giving the Knicks any calls, Right. Secondly, the Pacers were last in free throw margin the entire season, meaning teams on average shot yeah. more free throws than them than any other and team they in the just league. They fire a bunch of threes. They fire a bunch of threes and they foul a bunch because they're terrible defensively. And yet, in the first two games, if you factor out intentional fouls and technical fouls, it was almost dead even in free throws the first two games. So he had no argument there. And then when you look at this, this is my biggest issue with this series in the what the NBA did. Going into the series, the Knicks were down. Julius Randle, he was out from the beginning of the season, right? Or beginning of the playoffs. He's out for the playoffs. They lose Bojan Bogdanovic, who was a double-digit point-a-game scorer for the Knicks in Game 3 of the Philly series. So this is a, this is a beat-up Knicks team already. And the NBA picks this, this series specifically, and given a lot of the series are similar, but picks this series specifically to give no extra days off between games one, two, three, four, five, and then between games six and seven. Every single game in the series, including game two to three, where there's a travel situation, and then from game four, which was last night, to game five, which is tomorrow, there is no extra day. There's no travel Oh, I figured day. out why they couldn't between four and five. It's because the Rangers are playing at home. They could do two days. They could do yeah, two days. That would never happen. But the, I agree. Well, the Nuggets did been... a three-day. The Nuggets had a three-day break yeah, in between but, act series. Yeah, but it just depends who's playing at home. Like, if the Rangers, the NHL playoffs, like Madison Square Garden, they, they don't get... They have that, like, on... Pay, like, that was already set in stone, I guess, and the Rangers have home ice. So then the basketball had to go around that, or they could choose to play. Why did before they take or after? 
because the series ended before. They didn't know the Knicks. The Knicks series went seven games. Okay, here's the here's the thing then. You know the schedule, right? You could have gone a day in between two and three and easily fixed this. You could have gone a day in an extra day in between no, six, no, no, no. They could have three, but, and then you could go on an extra day in between five, four, and yeah, five. It makes but zero the NBA sense. just because the NBA would rather have. I think the NBA would rather have games on weekends. So it's like they're trying yeah, to. I mean, re- Adam yeah, Silver's ratings. a fucking idiot. I think that's but, absolutely ridiculous. But the reason they don't have a day, I know for a fact that the reason they don't have a day between the first four games and game five or two days is because the Rangers play. Um, the Rangers are playing at home, so that's yeah, that's, 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 that's the deal. Ridiculous to me. And if you're the NBA, you have your biggest market team who's actually fun to watch for the first time in years, and you fuck them over by scheduling it that way. Like absolutely stupid. You know, obviously, we've talked about the injuries. When we were talking about this series last week, that was what what I just mentioned. Bojan Bogdanovic and Randall were the two we knew were out. So they were down to like a seven-man rotation at that point. They then lose Mitchell Robinson in game one for the rest of the playoffs. And then they lose OG Ananobi to the hamstring. Have you ever seen a team this beat up before in a playoff run this deep in the playoffs? Mm. This is ridiculous. I've never I mean, seen it like all it. going down. Brunson's even hurt. It's probably a testament to the fact that they just want, I mean, they've lost, they've been without Randall for a long time and then they lost Bog, Bogdanovich and all those guys. I mean, they, Josh Hart's playing the, the whole game, the whole game. So, I mean, it, you can't, and that's half on, I mean, you know, I get that injuries happen and you know, it is very unfortunate for them, but when you're, when you're playing, when you're using these guys in this many this many minutes and this kind of stressful situation, you go seven games and you're playing every, you know, every yeah. other day, like you say, it's just bound to happen. I mean, it's going to happen, but uh, yeah, no, I can't remember anybody being like this beat up. I mean, they're legitimately down. It seems like like six players. They like, are. I mean, yeah, you have, you have I mean, I know they have other guys, but I mean that never play. I mean, yeah. it was like, I guess they have seven guys right now that have played. I mean, I know one of six. them, six that have actually because it's uh, who who have they been using? Oh, Alec Burks has been playing. Alec okay. Burks came in and played yeah. well on the offensive, and yeah. he's so yeah. bad defensively that it hurts. But like that's the guy. Like they had to put him in the game, and they had to put Jericho Sims in the game. Neither of which have played in the whole playoffs until yeah. Game Four. Yep. And then or Game Three, I guess. And then like, I in terms of this matchup, I do want to mention one thing, which is Tibbs made a big mistake. I think. Well, first of all. He made a bunch of mistakes. Like we watched Game Four; they're down thirty at halftime. Everybody, nobody should have played yeah. the second half. You're never coming back. You have guys with all these minutes on their legs. You're playing in at you with one day rest, like we talked about for Game Five, which is basically their series. It's their season. Like if they lose Game Five, the series is over, and you you just have to you have to pull the guys there and concede. I thought we talked about this in the middle of the week. I was like talking about after they won Game Two. I was like, you know what? The way Ananobi get went down, like I might legitimately just not play Brunson, Hart, and DiVincenzo game three, take the L, give them the extra rest, and make it a game four. And and given they they should have won game three, but by doing it that way, when they lost, they lost two games. Like by losing the way they yeah. did, and that was another scheduling issue. Not only have they had like no rest in between, but that game was on Friday night. And it finished at like eight o'clock, and then they played at like two thirty on Sunday. Like it was like a, a thirty-five hour, hour hour turnaround. It was ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I I do think one important thing that Tibbs got from last night was it was so bad in the first half. Him starting Precious Achua at the four and Hardenstein at the five, which now you have two guys on the floor who literally cannot shoot outside the paint. And it makes it impossible for Brunson, Hart, and DiVincenzo to really consistently get to the rim and spread the floor because they just sit off a Chua when he sits in the corner. He finally made the adjustment because it was so bad in the first half offensively that he put Miles McBride in the starting lineup to start the second half. He should have done that from the start of game three. Because they stayed in the game, game three, he never made that adjustment. Maybe that's the one beneficial thing to take away from yesterday. Like, okay, he's going to come out with McBride. McBride has been shooting 44% from three in the playoffs. Big, big difference. He's a better perimeter defender than Achua. I don't get what that move was in, in the modern day NBA. Playing two bigs is crazy. Yeah, I mean, I know full disclosure, nothing about either of them. Oh, I know, just, I know that's just logic. Achua, but uh, I had no nothing about either of those players. And they're, they're, they're probably not great. But uh, I mean, I know the name Precious Achua. But yeah, I think uh, the big mistake for me is I get it's a playoff game when you're down thirty 
or even whatever, like we, we touched on this, but when you're, when you're down that many, there's a 0% chance you're coming back. 100%. When the other bench is outscoring your bench by like 40 points a game, you're down 30 points. Just pull everybody. Yeah. Why, why were those guys out there? Now, I know they did that like in the fourth quarter, I assume. I wasn't paying that close attention. Man, it was hockey. Like- but in the, in none of those guys should have played third quarter. Right. It's like, hey, guys, you know, whatever. We're waving. Honestly, when it was, I think it was 30 points, six minutes through the second. And I was like, they hit that three. And I was like, I would call timeout and pull everybody. The yeah. game's over. Just get everybody rest and go home. And and some people will argue, oh, it's a playoff game. You can't give up. You can give up when you have six guys that are playing. Right. You're down 30 points on the road in a game that you're already, I mean, I don't know what Vegas made them underdogs, like seven points again, six it or seven points. It was a points. little shorter because yeah. of the outcome in game three. But yeah, it was like six and a half points. Yeah. But you're right. And it's like, this is a unique situation. Like I'm the guy, I'm the guy who's like pissed when pop is pulling guys in like the fourth quarter, we're down 15. He's like, all right, we're going to say he used to do this in, in games. Like we're on the road. We're going to save him for game seven or game five, whatever. And I would get annoyed. So I'm, the, I'm anti doing that. And I was like, when you said it in the second quarter, I didn't say it was crazy. I was like, no, I think you're right. They should literally pull them right now. This is a unique situation. They have no one left. Yeah, you no need way to, to pull everybody out. now and just concede this game. Like, this is a, just a different situation. I, I, we can move on. I want to mention one more thing because we were talking about Brian Windhorse before this. Pod- Wendy. W- yeah. I, I mean, he's a complete fucking moron. I mean, you were talking about him, um, you know, talking about how obvious he was talking about, you know, there's going to be veterans flocking to San Antonio to play with Wimby. Like, what a brilliant statement. I mean, LeBron must have really just liked the guy because he can just manipulate him to say only positive things about him because LeBron can't take negative criticism. Like, he just cannot do it. Uh, oh, my God. Because he literally brings... LeBron and Big Dog are two of the toughest skinned people oh, I yeah, know. Oh, yeah, yeah. They can take criticism from anywhere. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> they, well, they're, they're also the two guys who would create a show to talk about how they're the greatest of all time and have only people in there to, to agree with them and That's nobody fair. to disagree That's with fair, them. but when you're the greatest of all time... You're you gotta, not the, they're not the have greatest of shows. all time, and LeBron's not even top five greatest of all time. Now, <laughs> okay, statistically, longevity-wise, he is, but in terms of like building a team to win the most championships yeah, ever, no, he's, I mean, I'm he's never drafting him in the top five ever. He's definitely never in the GOAT conversation. No. no. Um, now, Windhorse said... I just saw this quick video, and it was like, uh, Brian Windhorse talks about how Pacers were able to flip this series. And it's like, oh yeah, it's really fucking impressive that the Pacers were able to win two games at home when the Knicks were down to fucking guys like Alec Burks and fucking Jericho Sims off the bench playing 25 minutes a game. Like, yeah, thanks, Brian Windhorst. Thank you so much for that brilliant take that the Pacers, how impressive it was that they were able to come back in this series they should have been embarrassed that the game was even close. They were this close to getting fucking swept with this Knicks team. Because if they lose that game three, who knows what happens in game four, regardless of the injuries. Because they very well should have lost game three. The Pacers are the luckiest team in the fucking league. Luckiest team in the playoffs. It would be a travesty if they won this series in a horrible, horrible Eastern Conference Finals. Nobody wants to see the Pacers play the Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals outside of people from Indiana. No one. Nobody, even even you, and we have a little side bet that we made before these extra injuries happen on the Diet Pepsi bet. Fucking genius. I knew they were coming. Big Dog told uh, me. Yeah. Big Dog told you me. You knew every, the injuries were coming? Yeah, Big Dog yeah. told me everything was coming. Sure, <laughs> sure looked like it was about to be a sweep or a five-game series till those injuries happened. But yeah, the, uh, the Pacers winning this series would be an absolute travesty. And even you, who, who have incentive to root for the Pacers in game one, were like, I kind of find myself rooting for the Knicks. Like... Everybody's rooting for the Knicks here. So, anyway. I just like Dante DiVincenzo. I love Dante. I hate everybody else in the league. He's a gritty dog. Actually, I like Dante. Oh, and I like my boy McConnell, of course. He needs to be a fucking spur. Guy's a little bulldog out I, there. I'm not a Mc- McConnell does not belong on the Oh, my ball. God. He's perfect. He's like, uh, he's like, um, I'm trying to think of who he reminds He reminds me of like a little bit crazier Patty Mills, but. He's Patty. Obviously, Patty could shoot it better. Yeah. But he was just a guy that would like try to pick you up like half court Pass and just be you. a pest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I think of him, but McConnell. <laughs> like, I think everybody like hates him but respects him because he's like, he's so fucking annoying and he doesn't care. He doesn't want to be anybody's friend out there. No. He's trying to uh, annoy like he's picking up T's on the bench, yelling at people in the crowd. <laughs> like it's fucking hysterical. I- now I think um I think um going back to um the coach, um, Rick Carlisle. Rick Carlisle. 
I, a couple times I'm like, why would they not have McConnell in the game, like in game oh, two or whatever the close game was where he had like 17 points in the game. It was the only one that was like kind of stopping Brunson. And they took him out of the game and Brunson scored like 15 straight yep. points. And I'm like, what the fuck is Rick Carlisle doing? But anyway, let's move on to another series. No, but I, yeah, I agree. As a, that, the series would have been quick if it wasn't for the injuries now. Who knows what's going to happen with yeah, the Knicks. Now, now I, think it, I think it legitimately comes down to game five in terms of like, if the Pacers win Game Five, the series is over. If the Knicks win Game Five, they have a sh- at least they have a shot in Game Seven because I just don't see them winning in Indiana this shorthanded unless somehow OG comes back Game Six, which I doubt. I think Game Seven would be the only option. It, yeah, I almost. I mean, people are going to call this take nuts too, but I almost think if they win, I almost think that if they win Game Five, you play everybody like the first quarter of Game Six, and if you're not like. You know, if you're no, I you know, whatever, I like if you go the second you go down like double digits or 15, you just sit everybody. I agree. And and then try to get OG back for game seven. Yeah, especially if you think you're going to get OG back for game seven, because yeah. then it's like, OK, let's just keep we haven't lost at home all playoffs, which if they win game five will c- can continue to be the case. And then it's like, OK, yeah. we're getting OG back. We should be. Because they're still, oddly enough, they're two and a half point favorites tomorrow at home at MSG. Like, which, you know, that that's kind of surprising to me because. I feel like if they're if they're playing any other team in the playoffs remaining, they're an underdog at home. But it's just the Pacers are that bad well, defensively. It doesn't really make a lot of sense because it's like I think the Pacers were favored by like you said six or whatever at home. Yeah. So now you're going to you're saying Madison. I mean, it's pretty much same well, teams, right? Or is Halliburton is Halliburton no, it, questionable? Or it's something? the same teams. It's just the fact that neither team has lost at home the whole playoffs. I get it. And so but eight and a half points is oh, a, lot a lot of points for, for home NBA, court. Yeah. For an NBA home court, it's a ton. It is. Yeah, you're right. It's a lot of points. I think it's probably too much. It probably should be closer to a pick 'em. Uh, I actually thought the Pacers would be favored, to be honest. But all right, we'll move on. Real quick, though, th- this isn't. This is just before we touch on the next series. I think this is a good topic because it segues from the Knicks. I want to ask you this question. So, this has been one of the weirdest playoffs in the sense of I don't know if I've ever seen the amount of injuries to players in a playoffs. I mean. I'll go through a quick list and run down for you. We already talked about the Knicks, right? Randall, Bogdanovich, Mitchell Robinson, OG, and Anobi, with three of them being complete playoff ending. The Bucks, Giannis, out pre-playoffs, missed the whole first series. series. Lillard missed two games within the series. The Kings, trying to get in the play-in game, were down Kevin Herter and Malik Monk. The yeah. Suns lost Grayson Allen during the playoffs. The Celtics have had Kristaps Porzingis out for a whole series, plus some. Clippers, Kawhi Leonard, although that doesn't count because he's just a total bitch. Mavs, Luka Doncic has been dealing with a with an injury the entire playoffs. The Cavs have missed Jarrett Allen for the entire series against the Celtics. The Heat lost Jimmy Butler and Terry Rozier. The Sixers had Embiid beat up. The Pelicans lost Zion Williamson. The Nuggets, Jamal Murray's been dealing with a calf injury. Legitimately, the T-Wolves, the Magic, and the Thunder are the only teams who really haven't been dealing with some sort of injury in the playoffs to a major contributor. What is causing all these injuries in a day where we have all these things with load management and guys not wanting to play games and all this stuff about taking care of your body. Why are we seeing more injuries than ever before in the most important time of the year? What do you think? No idea. No clue. It's weird. I don't know what it could just be with the way they're doing strength and conditioning. I mean, you know, I have no idea. I remember that, you know, people were talking about it must be the turf and Baltimore when like they lost, eight guys to ACL injuries and they're like, okay, well at what point do we look at the strength and conditioning guy? Because we must be doing something with these workouts that are really bad for ACLs because you know, you don't know, but yeah, it seems like something's definitely off. It definitely seems like the load management's not working. Do you, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Do you think this is valid? I was trying to think of some ideas last yeah. night for why it's happening. Tell me if you think I'm valid on any of these points. Yeah, I ahead. thought one, one re- number one reason I said, or one of the reasons I said, it feels like, and we talk about how it's so boring to watch the NBA regular season because nobody tries. And a lot of those guys are going at 70% until maybe the fourth quarter, right? Like then in the fourth quarter, they turn it on and they try to win the game. But for a lot of the game, they're not playing at the highest level they can. So for the entire year, you're doing that. In addition, you're probably playing, you know, say a star, he might play 32 to 33, 34 minutes a game, right? On average. And then you go to the playoffs his minutes go up to 38, 39, some guys even in the 40s. 
right, per game, and they start playing at a hun- at 90 to 100% the entire game and play more minutes, do you think that, that there's that dichotomy could play a role in I mean, it? I think it has to. I mean, right? I, I don't I don't know what else it could be. I feel like that has to be it. I think, you know, the regular season being less demanding and then all of a sudden, you know, it's still demanding because it's a long season, right? It takes wear and tear on your body, but then you try to up your output once you get to the playoffs. It's probably everybody's body just breaking down. Right. I, I don't know. It just seems like when those old school guys played every fucking game and no one sat down and they played the same way every right. single game, there was less injuries. But I who agree. Knows? But and I, and I, think- I mean, maybe the game, you could maybe make the argument that the game, it's definitely less physical, but I mean, I don't know if it's more athletic. I mean, you do see guys yeah. trying to fly in it. I mean, we had Anthony Edwards yeah. flying in. And, and like, you know, if I'm the T-Wolves, I love the way Anthony Edwards plays with an edge. I would never say anything, but like, he just goes to these fucking crazy dunks over people. And I'm like, eventually someone's not going to like it. And it's going to go up and hit him in the face. And he's going to go down and get hurt. Like, Look I mean, John ja Morant, same yeah. thing, right? I mean, yeah, just a freak. But I, I obviously we're just guessing what it is, but what you said makes sense. I think it's got to be something yeah. like that, but it just he, seems like no one can stay healthy, I even think, with the load management. So, right. And I think that plays a role. And also I would say, the only other two, the only other t- two things I could think of were number one. You know, I think back in the day, and maybe I'm wrong because I don't. I'm not saying I know this, but it feels like in today's age, these guys are training year round, where they're like the whole summer they're doing something and they're playing in the Drew League or they're playing at Rucker Park and they're training ten plus hours a day with their personal trainer and they're doing all this. And then, like, back in the day, I think guys took more time off. Maybe not. Maybe not. Um, I think that could play a role. I do think you look at a guy like LeBron James, who's played for 18, 19 seasons, right? However many he's played, 20 seasons. And he's never had a serious, significant injury. Playing, going to probably play into his 40s. And what does he do? He invests a million dollars a year into his body in the offseason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wonder if some of these younger guys who make this money are just like, you know, we're going to get, we're going to, we're using our money on our trainers to get better and they spend money and live these lavish lifestyles, which understandably so, I would do the same thing. But, you know, I don't, maybe they don't invest the money in their body like like a guy like LeBron because you see a guy do that no, and play that lot long of with them, that force. Yeah. You would think that he, if he's able to do it, most other guys should be able to do yeah, the same thing. No, the other guys don't do that. And I think, I mean, there's a lot of guys that do stuff year round. There's a lot of guys that the off season, I mean, Zion Williamson's, you know, banging porn stars and eating six square meals a day. I mean, there's, a, you know, and there's other guys that, you know, take care of their body, whatever. I, who knows what the injuries happen, but you're right. LeBron James is a testament to, so one thing you got to give him credit for is the guy's never hurt. Yeah. And he's been around for a long time. And it's not like he's a skinny, I mean, dude's a big dude That's running what I'm around there. Yeah. Power and force. yeah, it's a big dude. It's, big dude. it's 200, and I, you know, they lie about his weight, but it's back, you know, five years ago, it was 275 yeah. pounds running around. He's yeah. six foot, you know, nine. Yes, he's ma- So he's, he's a, a massive human. So... Uh, I and you're right. That's a testament to who he should. Whoever it is, once he's done playing, these kids should be like, "Hey, man, what do you do to never get hurt?" I, I want to know. But you're right; they spend so much money. It's like these guys, completely different sport, but it's like these guys that play, you know, have played golf for a hundred years. Like people think of golf as not a physically demanding sport, but I promise you, <laughs> when you go out, it's it's so different. Like you know, there's people that are going to be thinking this takes crazy. Golf is an absolute grind. It's week in, week out. You show up to a different course. Obviously, someone's carrying your bag, but you play a pro-am round and a practice round. You're playing, you know, a round of golf every day, not to mention hitting hundreds of range balls each day. And, like, some of those guys, like Justin Rose, who stayed young and has been around forever, hasn't won a ton lately, but he legitimately travels to each play. His driver that drives his RV and another one that drives his other RV and one of his RVs is legitimately just like a wellness spa. There's everything he needs in there. Wow. Like just a, you know, just crazy rejuvenation stuff yeah. that he plays. He'll go spend three hours in there and then go eat dinner and like whatever. And like, like smart. that helps. Yeah. I mean, they don't make them like John Daly anymore where it's like, you know, why are you never hurt? You can't I wish pull, they would. You can't pull fat is like the greatest line of all time. You never hurt John. Like everybody, you can't pull fat. It's just like out there drinking 17 Diet Cokes. It's like one of my favorite stories where Tiger Woods asked at one time, like, JD, man, it was hot out there. How many bottles of water 
did you have? <laughs> and he said, none, but I had 14 Diet Cokes and six bags of peanut M&Ms. And Tiger's like, that was 100. And Johnny was like, oh, yeah, that's true. And, and a pack like, of Marlboro Reds. Yeah, yeah, at least a pack of cigarettes. That, that guy is a legend. I absolutely love John I, I don't know how. I don't know how the man does that it. That would be... You know, dream to come on the podcast. John John Daly would be up there oh, to yeah. get jo- to get him on the podcast, and we that one I may allow Big Dog on the podcast if John Daly was here, just oh, yeah. because it would be that's funny just, to hear the back guy. and forth yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, that's John. He listens to his golf advice. He's just swing it light, just irons real rip light. It, hit, rip it, hit your hit your five iron like you hit your pitching wedge. Okay, uh, I, I guess he's found some videos of Daly on there. Um, all that's right, why he's so good these days? Yeah, that's that's why he's so good. You know, he's about as good at pickleball as he is at golf. Oh I mean, I hit God. a ball. I hit a ball. He was standing in the middle of the court, and it hit in front of his feet, and he called it out. Oh, Bailey, by the way, you don't have a mic over there. Big Dog says he's coming for you. A couple more weeks of practices, he says he's going to take you out on the pickleball court. Turner said, That's Turner the, uh, said you, should, he should play you, Bailey. And I said Bailey would beat him, and Turner said, oh, please. Oh, that's Big Dog. Yeah, oh, please. Oh, please. He would smoke Bailey. Oh, yeah. Smoke him. So just remember, when, you're, <laughs> when, you, when you ever side with Big Dog and Turner— and remember who defends you over here at all costs. Oh, and they're yeah. on the other side. So, you know, you like to sway back and forth. And sometimes you're on Turner's side and big. Sometimes you're on my. Just keep in mind, I'm a loyal person. They're fucking not. So just fucking remember that, Bailey. And we do next week. We should have done it. I have the extra mic. We got to give. I have a. I'm going to bring Stan. Bailey has a mic next week. Unless Big Dog comes on the show and takes his mic. Then Big Dog, that would be funny because every time Big Dog comes on, he then give me my Bailey's fucking mic. mic back. But yes, but Bailey needs a mic next week so he can interject and give we his, should give get his that on video. Takes. We we should get it on video where him and Bailey do play singles match and. I I think you could too, I, Bailey. I would bet money on you to beat him. I'll I will literally lay the odds. I, I have no, I think I he's have, a minus one eighty favorite. Have, I have no comment. But... I have to see Bailey hit, but I'll tell you this: my dad can't fucking move. If we have a legitimate linesman. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. He can't. I'm telling you, like, I, I, he won't score a point on me, and I'm not. Look, I'll hand it to him. He actually hits the ball pretty good. So he might. He, he, he might. He, like I said, when I went out there, I will say, obviously, your mom and you play a lot, but your mom is played tennis and and whatnot. She hits it pretty good. Yeah, especially like for her age and being out there, and she moves pretty good. But I, like I said, I do give Big Dog credit because I did not think I have been out there with him. Obviously, playing paddle tennis, paddle tennis is a little harder to control because it's a tennis ball. He was maybe he was just putting on a show because he had an audience out. No, there. no, he, he was played, playing pretty no, good. No, no, yesterday. listen, listen, listen. He played good for sure. He played good. Here's the caveat, right? Okay, the balls we were using, they're not regulation balls. Okay. He likes him because he spins the ball and can hit them and goes a lot harder so he can actually hit winners. The legitimate balls, the Franklin balls, they're, you have to hit them harder. Yeah, those balls looked a little heavy yesterday. They, they were, were going, sailing, they go yeah. like, for example, if I come to the net, it's hard for my mom to hit a winner past me. With those red balls, she'll hit multiple winners because they go... They mu- go faster. If yeah, you, they're, if they're, you hit, hev- they're heavier. Yeah, if you hit the yellow ball it, like as hard as you can, it comes up to your eye level. The red ball goes five feet over my head. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's twice the balance and speed. So, And we allow my dad to play. It's like, it's like playing with the kitty ball for the kids. Yeah, exactly. So, no, you'll play big dogs rules, no, Bailey. He and you and play he with walked, his net. You play with his balls. The day before when we played, he said that he he walked up. He goes, "I like those red balls." And we, I told my mom to let him play with the red balls because he it gave him a better chance of playing good. Because I feel bad for him, despite oh what he said. He also He's and the, the day before Turner came over there when we played, I did not use a derogatory term once. I was called a bitch forty seven times and told "fuck you" another twenty three times. So I, I think it was a total of like. In the over the seventies, in terms of like the cursing insults at me, where I told was told to fuck off or eat shit, bitch. That's old school. That's and old school, right there. That's like I, Michael Jordan shit. I told him. I told him when he went out there. I said the two greatest athletes that this world has ever seen are you and Bo Jackson, and I'm not putting you in any particular order. And he said, "Fucking damn straight." <laughs> My okay. mine, the best <laughs> athlete I've ever seen is Dion's cousin. Oh yeah, Junebug. Junebug, his crackhead cousin. <laughs> It's one of the greatest stories of all time. Junebug, baby. You gotta look that up. He used to People. steal my shit and I could never catch, catch him. Catch him. Didn't catch Junebug. <laughs> all right, let's touch on... Well, look, because we just talked about the East, and this will be a quick one, let's touch on Celtics-Cavs. We got game four tonight. The Celtics always tend to stumble, right? It's just what they do. I, You know, it's funny. I texted you this. I don't know if you actually saw it, but I texted you. I said, if you had faded the Celtics when they were playing at home in the playoffs the last two years, you'd be up like over... 
15, 20 oh, units. Just take another they're taking money the, money line, the money line dog against them at home. And then I saw Barstool tweet something out like the next day that if you had faded the Celtics the last three years at home on the money line, you'd be up 35 units. They're, they're, oh, yeah. They're, just because that Heat series where they were losing. every Dude, they're yeah. 14 and 14 at home in the last three seasons, 8 and 8 at home in the, in, under Joe Mazzulla the last two seasons in the what playoffs. A, what a coach. Too. So they just, <laughs> they, I mean, they're legitimately, under Mazzulla, they're legitimately better on the road. They're nine and three on the road under Missoula in the playoffs, eight and eight at home. And every single series, like last series against the the Miami Heat, this Miami Heat team with no Jimmy Butler, no Terry Rozier, had Tyler Hero and Bam Adebayo and a bunch of dudes like the Knicks had off the street. And they still beat them in game two in Boston. And then you see the Cavs go into Boston in game two and do the exact same thing, beat them by 25. Yeah. Obvious, obviously, excuse me, obviously the Cavs come back game three, Celtics dominate. But... I do, I, I do you? I guess let's let's ask this. Neither of us think the Cavs are going to have a shot to win this series. No, I think we both said uh, Celtics in four or five. We said that might they're going to lose. The, the Cavs ones. might get one, right? Yeah. But I think that would be their. I think you, that's going to be their only loss. Yeah. Question number one: They could lose a second, but question number because Mitchell's that good right now. But question number one: the, they're they're currently minus one fifteen. The Celtics are to win the NBA championship. They're by far the biggest favorite. Although I think that could have changed after the Nuggets won last night and got the series back even because anticipating the Nuggets being out helps the Celtics quite a bit. Do you think they're deserving to be that big of favorites given they've never won a championship with this core? Yeah, and- I think they'd actually be bigger favorites because I think we touched on, we, we talked about this a little bit. It Okay, they're going to win this series, right? Right. And the, even if they get to the Knicks series, the Knicks have seven healthy players if OG does come back. So they're going to win that series too. So they'll be a minus three hundred favorite in that series, even with Ananobi. Yeah. Say. So so my whole point is, so you get them at minus one fifteen, and if they play anybody from the Den- West, anybody they're still but- going to no. Even against Denver, they'll be more than minus one fifteen. No, no, they will. No, they yeah. no, they hundred percent will. So that's like saying- to me, like if you are going to take it, you might as well just take it now. Right. We've talked about this. I'm I've retired. already done it. Yeah. Yeah. You've already done it. I'm retired, but it's just like we were talking about. I was like, that didn't make any sense that they're. Only minus one fifteen because I, you got to think the odds makers know they have pretty much a dude. I I mean I could I couldn't even imagine them being minus three hundred against the Knicks. I think they'll be like minus five hundred. You I mean, might you just, might be right. I, I mean I just I just Ananobi, don't know how they could possibly. Yeah, with Ananobi, it might be minus three hundred. Yeah, yeah. yeah. maybe, maybe minus three fifty. Maybe maybe Whatever. somewhere yeah, between. It'll be somewhere in that ramp. But they should they, win the East easy. And I mean, if if the Nuggets, which that series is still, and we'll talk about that series, but that series is still up in the air. If the Nuggets don't make the championship, they're a minus four hundred favorite against whoever they play out of the West. If they pay, if they play the Nuggets, they're probably what minus two hundred, minus two twenty, depending on how the Nuggets look in the next series against whoever they play. Or uh, do you think it'd be less? What do you think the Celtics will be? Yeah, Celtics against the Nuggets. What do you think they would be? If the if the Nuggets win the next two games of series and then win win in, in like five or six against, I think they'll be like minus one. 60 against the Nets. Yeah, I guess it depends I mean, they come the back looking good. I mean, yeah. Aaron Gordon's playing like he's fucking Superman, so. Well, I was just thinking about the like the title odds in terms yeah. of going in. I think it was like the the Celtics were like plus 125 or 135 yeah. and, the, and the Nuggets were like plus 300. So the difference there I would think would be around be close to 200, but yeah, regardless. Whatever. Yeah. Um I do want to mention also real quick on this series that the Celtics, or I'm sorry, the the Cavs, Donovan Mitchell, we talked about him last week. We talked about the Spurs going after him. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it every podcast until the free agency hits. We need to throw the kitchen sink at him. The guy is absolutely phenomenal. People just forget about how good he was in Utah because he went to fucking Cleveland where no one gives a shit. This Cleveland team, and no disrespect to Darius Garland, Bailey, but Darius Garland is ass, okay? Evan Mobley is ass, all right? Uh, uh, Isaac Okoro is fucking ass. Max Struess is the worst player I've ever oh seen. Oh my god! Show They're some respect. Fucking horrible. This man is carrying them on his fucking back. He hit six threes in the first half against the Celtics at home in Game Three. Put had like twenty seven points in the first half. Just carried him. He's just breaking bones in his body, putting the whole team on his back to keep him in this series. Willed them to a win in Game Two. He had a fifty point game in Game Six against Orlando. In the last five playoff games, he's averaging thirty seven a game. 
37. He's averaging 30 in the whole playoffs. One of the top scorers in the playoffs behind like Jalen Brunson and, and Anthony Edwards. Well, if we're gonna if we're gonna trade for him, we got to do it. Or he's gonna be a free agent. He, he he's gonna opt more than likely the way this is going. Oh, he's gonna, gonna lose in five. Out. He's gonna yeah, opt yeah, yeah. out, and so we should throw the kitchen sink in terms of like wh- whatever the max we can offer him. No. Yeah. Cut whoever we got to cut. Trade whoever we got to trade. We have most cap space of anybody going into this season. Honestly, we can get rid of someone. Will take Vassell. Hundred percent. He can score. So you get rid of that contract. Get him first, th- first you pay round Donovan round Mitchell pick. a max, and then even if we don't, even if we, even if we get like a second round pick for him, whatever, we dump that contract, bring Mitchell in, and then we have those. We have the fourth and eighth pick of the yeah. draft this year. So we go get a. We get you know, whoever we think, but we're going to get them on a cheaper deal right. anyway. So. And we'll talk about the draft lottery in a second, but for, but I completely agree. And then you also can pitch to him. Like to me, maybe in normal circumstances, yeah, it's going to be hard to pitch a guy to come to a 19 win team, but I think he's going to want to, I think he would want to play with Wimby and, oh, yeah. and try to win a championship. Like it, it would be like, like, you know, when he was in Utah, and they built in a similar organization around him and Gobert. They were the number one seed two or three times. It was just Gobert so bad in the playoffs that they couldn't win. That's why That's why they didn't win in the playoffs. They blew a 3-1 lead because Gobert was so fucking Speaking bad. Speaking of the Jazz, they got all those picks. What, do they not have... I didn't see... They weren't very good this year. They no. But they're not... Where they are they picking? They got like the 10th pick. Oh, okay. Something like that. They did not get a... They didn't get a super high pick. They... Um, I Let's see. They ended up getting the... I think it was 10th. Uh, yeah, they were the tenth pick. Got it. And they, but they do have more. Dra- like I think them and OKC are 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 the only ones who have more draft capital, more first round picks than the Spurs do in the next five or ten years. Yeah. I think over the next seven years, they said the Spurs have sixteen first round picks. The Spurs have. There's a potential for four first round picks next year and all of them could be lottery picks which is crazy it's and nuts. and next year is going to be a loaded draft we got two in the top eight which we'll talk about here in a minute but we'll we'll move on from this eastern conference series both of us think the celtics are going to take care of business tonight and they're going to go on and and probably win the east and probably the championship but let's go over to the west where we watched the game together last night the, the series everybody thought was going to be the best it was the weirdest series so far, right? This has been a very odd series. The Nuggets come out, lose games one and two at home. They then come out and win games two and three and four on the road. Only five times in NBA history has a team lost the first two games at home and come back to win the series. It sure feels like Denver has a good shot to do it now after last night. I want to talk about this series in general. Um, Obviously, I guess let's start, let's start with this. Neither of us thought the Nuggets had any shot. We were like, they're cooked, pretty much. I mean, it looked two. that way. If you, uh, if you watch game two, yeah, and Rudy Gobert came back and ruined the Minnesota Timberwolves. He, so that's my dumbass of the week, by the way, which oh. I'll get to in a minute. But The greatest basketball player to ever live, Naz Reed. <laughs> it took him off the floor and put Rudy back in. You're kryptonite, Naz Reed. Krypton, kryptonite, Naz. But he, um, what did he do last night? I who, Naz? No, he was he was playing really well. Fucking five of six again. I mean, dude, the just, guy. I just don't understand why. I mean, I just I get that Rudy Gobert is player of the year, and I get that they traded. I don't know how many first rounders, which is the dumbest trade. Five in, the, yeah, first the rounders. Dumbest trade in NBA history. Dumbest by, trade in NBA by history. Uh, we've been over it. You can't win championships with Rudy Gobert. It's that simple. Um, but. I mean, every time Naz reads in the game, he just kills it. Edwards last night was just unreal, too. 16 to 25, 44 real. points. 7 to 8 from the line, wait, wait, 5 of 8 from 3. Say that again. What was the... the he was 16 to 25. For how many points? 44. Wow. Unbelievable. 5 of 8 from 3. Yeah. He I mean, had 5 boards, 5 assists, 2 steals, and a block. He's just... he. I was talking about this the other day with somebody at dinner... He, if, if I was, if I was drafting a team right now and I was like, okay, like we're redrafting in the NBA, everybody has nobody on their team. We're going to pick you and you have the first overall pick. I think the only guy I would take before him is Wimby. And you could even make an argument that you could take him over Wimby. I just think Wimby's changes when we changes the game yeah so much you gotta go at that age. i think Wimby with Wimby the defense, one yeah then i would go legitimately i would go with anthony edwards number two yeah he's right there definitely in the conversation the hilarious thing is looking at this box score 
we just talked about how <laughs> worthless um, Kyle Anderson is. He was a minus 18 plus minus. And then Alexander Walker, right? Is that is uh, yeah. the guy from, uh, he was a minus 20. He's a minus 20? Yeah. Well, him the, and him and <laughs> Anderson were on the floor a lot together. Well, they were horrible. Well, the Anderson one is worse because Anderson's minus 18 and he played six minutes. Yeah, that's insane. That's absurd. Like, the other dude played 24 minutes. So, like, <laughs> That's understandable. Like you just kind of get caught in a bad spot, and you yeah. didn't. He didn't. He also didn't play well. He was one of seven, oh of four from three. But Kyle Anderson played six minutes and was a minus eighteen. That's like, almost that's, impossible. That's almost do. impossible to do. Like you, you can't be that bad. Nobody can be it that. It really bad. is almost impossible. To do. <laughs> that's one of the craziest I was just things. Thinking I've about the, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that. That's you, a six minute. I mean, a six minute minus eighteen. <laughs> That's like every time you come in for two minutes, you lose by six points. Yeah, you it's lose, like oh, I lost you, by six. Lost you lose six, by lost. you lose by every minute. You lose by three points. Yeah. So like every every they make a three and you don't score every possession. That's the what craziest happens. thing too. It's like the worst he played possible outcome. Six minutes. He missed one shot. He had zero rebounds, zero assists, zero steals, zero blocks. <laughs> one personal foul was minus eighteen. How much does that guy make again? Let's I mean, check it out. He's he is the absolute. He's going to be gone this year. After this year, no one's going to pick him up. Yeah, but that's he got a two-year, $18 million contract. Yeah, before that, he actually got paid, though, right? Didn't he get a decent amount of money? I think I'm he sure did. he yeah, did. Yeah, the yeah. Spurs the Spurs gave him a decent amount of money, stupid. too. stupid, yeah. It, he, he's made a total over his career of, uh, let's see. Oh, before this, he had signed, yeah, from, from 2018 to 2021, he had a four-year, $37 million. Before that, it was a three-year... One, uh, three year, three million dollar, three and a half million. So he's made 40, 58, almost 60 million dollars over his career. 60 million dollars that guy has made to be absolutely worthless. Unbelievable. Yeah, 60.1 million on his, on his career earnings. Unreal. Okay, back to this game real quick. So let's, let me ask you this to kind of start the conversation. Which is, do you think, uh, uh, actually, let me ref- let me start over. Yeah. Are you familiar with the story of the Zen master and the little boy? <laughs> no. Let me enlighten you here, okay? Yeah, please. Let me enlighten you guys. So, there was this little boy. Chinese folklore. And this Zen master. And on, the 14th bir- on his 14th birthday, this boy gets a horse. And everyone in the village says, how wonderful, the boy got a horse. Oh, yeah. I and the Zen this. master says, we'll see. Then a couple weeks later, the boy falls off his horse, breaks his leg, and everyone in the village says, how terrible. And we'll the master says, we'll see. Then a war breaks out, and all the young men have to go off and fight, but the little boy can't because his leg's all messed up. And everybody in the village says, how wonderful. And the Zen master says, we'll see. Exactly. So after game two, point of the story, after game two, we all said, how terrible for this little boy, right? The Nuggets, the poor Nuggets, they got beat. The champs are done. They're cooked. And Michael Malone went out and showed his team a clip of a uh, montage of clips of all the talking heads. Skip saying, Bayless and the boys Skip saying Bayless it's over. <laughs> Shannon Sharp and you know Stephen A. Smith. This is over. The T Wolves are going to the championship. The Nuggets are done. Jokic is done. Murray sucks. And little did we know, the Zen Master was saying we'll see because it might have been the best thing that ever happened to them. Yeah. Because I do, I do think this. If you look at the Lakers series, this 100 percent happened. Tell me if you disagree. This 100 percent happened. In that Lakers series, they were down at halftime every single game, right? They were down at halftime all five games. They won four of them. The double result was, I was betting the double result a bunch of the games where it was Lakers to be up at halftime, Nuggets to win the game, and it kept hitting, right? It felt like the Nuggets came out every game and played it like a regular season game. We're going to come out. We're going to just play at 70% in the third quarter, mid-third quarter, when we have to. We'll turn it on. We'll take the lead, and we'll find a way to win. And against the aging, shitty Lakers with LeBron and AD and all the bum D'Angelo Russell and Austin Reeves who got paid and didn't do shit and Rory Hachimura who couldn't make a shot to save his life, it worked. But two of those games were game winners by Jamal Murray. And if those yep. two shots don't go in and the Lakers end up winning those games, instead of winning 4-1, they're down 3-2, right? Those two games are big swing games in that series against a bad Lakers team. And they came out game one, and they played okay, but they got down 18-4 to four in game one. Same way they've been doing to the Lakers. And then they turned it on a little bit earlier, took the lead at halftime, ran out of gas, and lost. Oh, that's all right. We'll come back game two. We're the champs. We're not going to lose. They came out and did the same thing game two, got absolutely smacked by a team who plays super hard every single possession. And I think it was a will-see moment where it woke them up. 
and it was the best thing that ever happened to them because they came out and they won the first half by 15 in game three and then won the first half by 15 in game four because they tried from the start. They looked like a different team. I think that is a huge, huge turning point in this playoffs, and it could be the difference in another team making the Western Conference, winning the Western Conference, and the Nuggets repeating in the Western Conference. I think that is a difference. I guess I kind of touched on those points, but I'll ask you this. As a, from the T-Wolves perspective, young team, I know you're an Anthony Edwards guy. I love him. Are they going to be able to respond here, or is this series over? Are the, are, are the, it, we, we overreacted to the Nuggets, actually, although I don't think it really was an overreaction. Are we overreacting saying this series is over, or will this young T-Wolves team be able to dig deep, go into Denver, and win again? Because they have to do that to be able to win the series. We'll see. Oh, the Siri. That was so good, too. Yeah, I know. That was so good. I love Siri the we'll came see. up. We'll see. We'll see. I love it. Only, he, we'll, she, only, only the old Zim. We'll see. We'll see. He tells that Who story. Knows? Yeah, it'll be a, yeah, the rest of the series, it'll, it'll be interesting. I mean, I don't think anybody has, no one expected the first two. No one expected the second two. I'm sure we'll, I, I don't know. I think it ends up going seven. Nuggets and seven, but we'll see. So you, so you think they're gonna both? They're gonna now hold serve at home, or do you think I do. it's gonna I, stay? I, I don't know what game they'll win, but I do think the T was will win one more game. Okay. Think the Nuggets will get off to a bad start and one again, and then, um, and I think the coach for the T was will play Naz Reed more. I think he's got. The, I hope so. I think he's got the memo now. Well, they. I don't know because there's been this whole debate of like, can you play two big men? And by the way, the other big. Carl Anthony Towns was horrific last night. Terrible. He does some stupid shit. Yeah, he he was real, real he bad. He picks up just terrible fouls I, all the time. Like head scratching fouls. Like like it, it, something a circuit breaker breaks. It it literally feels like you're playing 2K and you you accidentally touch the intentional foul button and there's nothing you can do. The guy just runs over and just grabs the guy. That's what it feels like. But <laughs> but you know, in the uh, you know, I think I heard him say in the press conference, I don't think Rudy Gobert was an issue. Like, I don't think the fact that they're ignoring Rudy Gobert on the offensive end, which is another factor we haven't even talked about, how bad he is on the offensive end. I mean, he's been terrible. I think he's shooting... Terrible on balls off. It's like the only way he can score is an alley-oop. That's it. He had five turnovers Missed last night. Missed two free throws at the end, didn't he? Didn't yeah. matter, but I mean, he just... And he's terrible. only shooting... He's only shooting 50% from the field in this series, which for a guy who shoots, right. I mean, you should be shooting 65, 70%. He's shooting 45% from the free throw line in the series, had five turnovers last night. They win the the only game he didn't play by 30. I mean, it's just, he's the difference. And I, I, the last thing I want to mention in this series is we talked about it a bunch last night. Aaron Gordon was the X factor last night, a hundred percent. Like, the bench stepped up. Christian Brown was great. Justin Holiday hit some huge threes late in the game. I Aaron think he was Gordon three, blew his perfect night. He shot one that he shouldn't have shot. It's like, just pass it. He Have the perfect what night. What was he, like 11 of 11 at the time or 10 of 10? I think it was 10 of 10, and then he made – then he went fit, uh, yeah, he didn't finish 11 of 12, I think. 11 yeah, of 12, 11 yeah. 12. He was – and he made both free throws, too. If it wasn't yep. for that one shot, he didn't have to shoot it either. They were up late. Didn't matter. Um, but, yeah, he, he was phenomenal. I think I, I looked – he on the last, I believe in this series, is shooting 67% from three after not making a single three in the first series against the Lakers. And then he, in the last two games, is averaging 20 points per game in the last two when they've needed him the most. Mm-hmm. He's 16 of 19 from the field in those two games. That's 84%, 83% from three, 100% from the free throw line, five and a half rebounds, five assists. And he's a plus twenty seven plus minus in those two games. He has been the difference maker. Yeah, if it wasn't for him, they'd be down at least three one. Yes. So. And he and the reason is we talked about this. If you don't stretch Rudy Gobert out, it's he can sit at the rim and be a rim protector. And the Nuggets have decided they're not going to change their lineup. They're not going to go with Christian Brown over Aaron Gordon, and they're just going to trust Aaron Gordon. And you know what? It paid off for him. Mike Malone was right. And Aaron Gordon stepped up in the two biggest games, and he's the reason they won those two games. Now, Jokic was phenomenal last night. Murray was really good in game three. But the reason they, the, the reason they are able to win these games and the X factor in them getting up early is Aaron Gordon. 100%. He's been phenomenal. Good, yep. Shout out to Aaron Gordon. He's been great. I like Aaron Gordon a lot. Okay. We will move on now to the last series. Mavs Thunder. 
Mavs take game three at home after, I guess they took game two at OKC, then game three at home after losing game one. This feels eerily similar to the Clippers series where they got blown out game one against the Clippers on the road, came back and responded in one game two, took game three at home. But in game four, the Mavs stumbled against the Clippers at home with a chance to win, got down 30 early in the game, got willed back by Kyrie and Luka and were able to, weren't able to come up with the win. Do you think they're a pick em tonight, basically? I think they're a one-point favorite. Do you think they're able to win tonight, and go up 3-1, and advance pretty much win- by winning, they're going to more than likely advance? Or yeah. do you think the Thunder are going to be able to respond eh, here? I mean, I don't know. I kind of have a feeling the Mavs will just blow it tonight. It seems like they're the kind of team to do that. I think they're going to ultimately win the series, but I wouldn't be surprised if they lost tonight. If they do, like you said, the series is wrapped up. But yeah, I mean that's that's all I real really got for it. Luca, you know, if Luca goes off, obviously Mavs have a pretty good chance. PJ Washington's been great this series, which is just crazy. I mean, he's killing everybody. So yeah, um, I think uh, ultimately Mavs win the series tonight. I think it's a coin toss, and I guess obviously the line dictates that. So that's what I got for that one. I haven't been watching a ton of that series. I watched. Um, I don't know. I can't remember if it's game one or game two, but I think the Mavs will ultimately win the series. Yeah, you know, it is. It's interesting because I do think any team left could win the West. Uh, I don't think that the Thunder. I think the Thunder have the lowest odds. The Mavs have the second lowest odds, in my opinion, not yeah, not by yeah, Vegas. Yeah, yeah. But and then the winner of I think the winner of the T Wolves Nuggets will be the the favorite either way. But you know. It's kind of interesting. I think the Mavericks, oddly enough, are le- are a better match. They match up better. Not that they'd want. I don't think they'd rather play the Nuggets, but I think they match up better with the Nuggets. Whereas the Thunder match up better with the T Wolves because the Thunder have Chet Holmgren, who can naturally stretch Rudy Gobert out. So interesting to see which teams come out of each series. I think you're probably right. Like I would probably lean OKC tonight, but they're just so young. Oh, and I mean, I yeah, I don't I don't it, even know if I'd lean. Uh, I just think that the Mavs uh, just I just don't trust them as far as like yeah. taking a commanding three one lead. They kind of like screw around and they do. Like you said, lost game four to the you know Clips. Clippers. So I without mean, Kawhi, I was, um, Luca Luca's been a little banged up. He, yeah, I mean uh, oh, that's an understatement. He looks very hobbled out there. It it looks to me like he gets shot up before the game. He comes out real hyped and plays hard early. Like game three, or I'm sorry, was it game two? Game two, he came out and scored like 19 in the first quarter and then scored like eight the rest of the game because it looked like he just, it, whatever ha- whatever they shot him up with wore off by the second quarter is what it felt like. Um, I don't know that that's true, but that's what it looks like out there. I mean, he, yeah. basically by the third, late third quarter every game, he looks like he doesn't have much left. Like he's not able to just because I think in most situations he has Lou Dort on him who by the way fouls him on every possession but Lou Dort I think in in a healthy Luca is going to back him down a lot more and I haven't seen that because you don't he doesn't put that he don't want to put that weight on his knee and I think that's concerning Kyrie has to step up he stepped up late in game three but he's been weirdly unaggressive like very odd like he doesn't want to shoot the ball PJ Washington has been Absolutely phenomenal yeah, he's for the, the Mavericks. Reason they're up too long. Yeah, you know, not for him. They would be screwed. So. Absolutely. Um, I want to touch on one point here about the series, and then we'll talk about a few other things. Mavs home court advantage against the Clippers. I don't know if you remember this. It was it was Game Four, and they were down. They got down thirty in that game to the to the Clippers. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, and they came all the way back. They came the all the way back. Yeah. And a big reason they came all the way back was that crowd was. Rocking. I remember, I think it was Mike Breen said, I've never heard a crowd erupt from a team cutting a lead to 20. Yeah. I mean, they were going bonkers in there, and I don't know what got into them, but that was a big reason I liked the Mavs in this series is I thought they had a pretty equal home court from what I saw in the previous round to OKC, who's got one of the best home courts, if not the best home court in the NBA. But in game three, it was absolutely dead. Like, it was so weird. It was the opposite. 
I don't understand Mavericks. Everybody fans. was at the Stars game, probably. Is that what it was? <laughs> no. Did they have different no, arenas? No, they play in the same. Okay, I was like, what? I don't know. I'm just that's no. They play at the same. Well, it was just weird to show. me, and I I think that could play a role tonight. Like they need the crowd. They they feed off that. They weirdly feed off their crowd. Kyrie yeah. especially. He is a total like aura type guy. Like if the energy's high in that arena, he will fucking light it up. If he gets hot, if he if it's dead in there. He has trouble getting going sometimes. It's really odd. Luca, yeah. same thing. Luca likes to, to interact with the crowd. They need to be up and live tonight for them to win. I also want to say one thing, because I think this is funny, and I, I didn't realize this. You know that the Clippers, because Shea Gilgis Alexander has been phenomenal. He yeah. finished second in MVP they voting. They traded him to the Mavs. They traded him to the Mavs, but not only did they trade him to the Mavs. Oh, sorry, Thunder. The Thunder, Thunder yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. The Thunder. But not only did they trade him to the Thunder, listen to this trade. I didn't realize how bad this trade was. That was bad. This is borderline. I mean, it's not Rudy Gobert because Rudy Gobert is horrific, but it's borderline. The Clippers gave Shea Gildas Alexander and Danilo Gallinari five first round picks Fucking retarded. and two pick swaps for Paul George. All they got back was Paul George. And one of those picks, so they got Shea, who's an MVP candidate. One of those picks that they already cashed in was the first, was the 12th overall pick in 2022. That turned into Jalen Williams, who's their second leading scorer. And they have three first round picks left, plus a pick swap next year. I mean, that's one, that's got to be top five worst well, trade why, in NBA that's history. That's why Sam Presley's the best GM in the league by far, too, right? I yeah. Mean, I mean, what, what in the world were they thinking? I don't know. But you know what's funny is Kawhi fucked them because yeah, Kawhi they were came trying out to do and the publicly super team. Well, well, Kawhi came out and said, "If you guys don't go get Paul George, I'm gonna go sign with the Lakers." Instead of quietly telling him that, when then they could probably have gotten Paul George for at least half of that, but they were handcuffed. They did not. They were so desperate for a championship. They thought Kawhi is coming off winning this one in Toronto. We're gonna get Kawhi. We're gonna get yep. Paul George. We're gonna win a title. If we don't get Kawhi, and the Lakers get him, we're fucked. And yep. Ballmer was like, I don't give a fuck about the draft picks. We're going to win. If we win two championships, who cares? And then Kawhi ends up playing, fucking blowing a 3-1 lead to the Nuggets in the bubble, and then fucking playing three playoff games in four years. Yep. And now they have old fart Paul George and bum-ass Kawhi Leonard, and the Thunder have five, three more first-round draft picks and two yeah. NBA superstars. Stupid. I mean, or stupid, start one stupid, superstar stupid. and one good player. Yeah. Anyway, Crazy. I, I just wanted to shit on... Kawhi Leonard right there. I mean, he's the worst. Okay. He's the worst. Let's touch real quick on the NBA draft lottery. The big winners of the night were the Hawks and the Spurs. Hawks had a 3% chance of getting the first overall Oh, really? Pick. Shit, yep. I didn't realize that. They were like the 15th best odds. They were like one of the last place I teams. guess that makes sense. They lost they in the play-in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they got, they ended up getting, it was, I think it might have been the longest, one of the longest odds to ever get the first overall pick. And I, I, I think That's probably they, they try to keep Trey Young now. And build around him. Not that, not that this draft is all that great, and you can just go get some stars. Going to change your franchise. I really don't even know who the first pick's going to be. They're talking about those two guys from France. One of them being Alexander Saar. But the other, the other big winner of the night was definitely the San Antonio Spurs. They had the fifth best odds to get the to get the first overall pick. Ended up getting in the top four, and then Toronto was supposed to be in the top six. And dropped out of the top six, got eighth, and that allowed us to take that pick because we oh, we got that pick if it ended up outside yeah. the top six. So big winner, Spurs. Otherwise, there's a chance there's a chance that pick eventually turns into a second round pick. That's how that shit works. Like yeah. it'll go next year, and if next year it, we lose it again, it becomes a second round pick automatically the following year. So yeah. Anyway, biggest loser, obviously Pistons. Hundred percent the Pistons. But honestly. Do you expect anything different from the Pistons? No. They I mean, he, their last their last eight lottery picks. You know how many combined All Star game appearances they have? Zero. Zero. <laughs> Zero. Zero. Stanley Johnson, Henry Ellenson, Luke Kennard, Siako Duom Dumboya. Killian Hayes, Cade Cunningham, Jaden Ivey, Asur Thompson. Zero fucking all-star games. In fact, the only fucking first-round pick that they've ever drafted in the last 30 fucking years who has been an all-star is Andre Drummond, who got two all-star appearances and was a borderline all-star. And then the best player they've ever drafted, classic enough, 
was Chris Middleton in the second round. They traded him after one year, and he ended up being an all-NBA player. That's funny. They so didn't know they picked him. They don't deserve – this is why they can't have nice things. They don't deserve the number one overall pick. At least pick. the Lions are good. Yeah. Fuck the Pistons, all right? Spurs, though – Pistons should just move to Vegas. That's a good idea, actually. They're not – they can't – they won't – You really the like league. to shit on Detroit, don't you? I, well, I do. At least, at least they get the Lions. Listen, at least they got something nice. At least they got Dan Campbell losing his mind on the sideline, doing crazy shit. They're relevant. They're in the playoffs again. I mean, we'll see how long that lasts. They oh, did. They, did. they no, have the draft. They're they're they're, they they're the young. They're going to be a playoff team for a long time. Not with Jared Goof as their quarterback. No, I Noodle get arm somebody Goof. else. But yeah, that team is going to be good. They did have the draft, like Bailey said too, and there was like a hundred and fifty thousand. Hosted people. a fucking college basketball regional too. Yeah, it was a good regional. That was a great, great regional tournament. If you're the Spurs, who do, who you want at four? Just depends what we do in free agency. I mean, I think we get, I I, I guess we get either Reed Shepard or we get Dillingham. We have to get a point guard. So I, I mean, don't I think know, Reed Shepard's a point guard. Oh, well, shooting guard, whatever. We need someone that can score. I I I think we're gonna get rid of Vassell. So we should. Yeah. So I mean, I don't know. I think Reed Shepard can bring the ball up in the NBA, dude. It's not like anybody picks you up fucking full court, dude. How many white point guards are there in the NBA? Doesn't matter. He can dribble the ball better than all the rest of the whites. Ah, oh, man, I don't know he can. He, <sighs> dude, no one plays defense in the NBA. You don't get picked up. The only guys that pick you up half court are McConnell and Patrick Beverly. And Patrick point. Beverly might not even have a job next year. Fair point. So <laughs> you really don't. He shouldn't have a like, job next year. It's not like you have to like break pressure. He can dribble the ball up, but I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I guess he's not a traditional point guard. Dillingham I mean, is more of a scorer or two than a point guard. But I'm I don't fine know. with. I wouldn't mind getting Reed Shepard if we got him at eight. I don't want to waste a fourth number four pick. I, yeah, I mean, I just don't think this in this year's draft. I don't think there's a lot of difference between four and eight. There's I don't not, even think people even know there's who's going to go between four or eight. Yeah, but like, I mean, what's cr- I understand this is how bad the draft is this year. It's terrible which is why I'd even maybe consider trading one of the picks or packaging both and getting a better chance of getting another one next year. Regardless, like, Reed Shepard scored two points in that game against Oakland in the biggest game of his career. He shit himself. And his draft stock rose. It makes zero sense. I don't get it. I do not understand how they have him above Dalton Connect. That's who I want. I don't care if we get him at four or eight. I just want to draft him. They think he's going to be there at eight. They have actually, ESPN came out with a projection Yesterday, and it had us taking Dillingham at four, and it had us taking Connect at eight. That'd be awesome. That'd, which be, I would that'd be, be fine. I would with those love that. Guys, I'd yeah. be fine with me. Or if, or even you know, Connect and Reed Shepard, I'd be okay with that too. You know, the the dynamic duo who, will, if they if we draft those two white boys, they're both going on the Wall of Fame immediately <laughs> on the Grit Wall of Fame. There are auto picks on there. What's up with you loving white basketball players? And you're wearing a Santa Clara Steve Nash jersey. Damn straight, baby. <laughs> like that. Hey. Look, I gotta support my culture. Okay, what's wrong with that? Nothing. Uh, nothing. The white I mean, basketball I, I like, player. I like is, Dillingham. Though I like Dillingham too. I also like Reed Shepard, and I like actually. I take it back. I don't really like Reed Shepard, but I would kind of like him on the team for some reason. I don't know why. I love Dalton Connect. I want Dalton Connect. That's my boy. In fact, I will immediately buy a Dalton Connect jersey if they draft him. I'll buy a Reed Shepard jersey too. I'll buy a Rob Dillingham Spurs jersey too. I'll do all three. Whoever whoever gets drafted, in all fact, three. In them. fact, if we get a get a Dal- if Dalton Connect gets drafted, I will give away a Dalton Connect Spurs jersey. On he'll give away five. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Five of them. What am I made of money here? Okay, no Just, big dogs made of big dog. It's on big dog. Big dog. Well, I say it's on big dog. It's on big dog. Oh, okay, uh, <laughs> one, 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 one. let me write that down. Five jerseys. Big dog. Big dog. Well, yes. Big dog owes big five jerseys five. to people that comment. All right. You heard it, Bailey. Got it on <laughs> five on jerseys. There. Five jerseys he owes us, and and you never That's said from the nothing. Chinese website. That's nothing from Big Dog. Oh, it's definitely going to be the Chinese website. All right, um, counterfeit goods. All right, uh, per per Turner's request, we have to move off the NBA because it's oh, been Jesus too much Christ. fucking NBA for him today. There's no way you people at home can stomach that much NBA. It's the playoffs. Come I mean, on. it is really the only thing to talk it's about. It is. It is. About. I mean, it is true. I'll it really, give I mean, you, so I'll give you. I will give you credit. It really is. Like I said, I was thinking about that during the whole hour long conversation. I was like, well, 
I really don't like the NBA, but it really is the only thing. It's the only about. thing going on right now. Well, NHL playoffs. But well, okay. I'm where we are in the country, where we are in the country, no one gives a shit about the NHL. So that is true. I'm going to give you the floor here. No, let's just talk golf. We have the the PGA is coming up this weekend. So you don't want to talk just, NHL yet? No, we can, but we'll just start golf. Okay, Rory McIlroy okay. down two after hole seven comes back to win by five, even after a double bogey. What on 18. tournament was that again? Quail Hollow, Wells Fargo Championship. It's, he's he's won, always yeah. He's won several times. Time, right? He's won several times yeah. there. And uh, peaking at the right time going into the PGA Championship next year where he won his last major at Valhalla. Um, Scotty Scheffler is going to be back from daddy duty. So Rory was probably really hoping that he would be at home for daddy duty so he could be a much better chance of winning a, his first major in 10 years. It's hilarious if you see the picture of Rory at Valhalla, Valhalla like 10 years ago. with You know, curly, just like – Night and day difference. Different how he guy. looks. Yeah, it's been been a been a long time. He's so. aged quite a bit since then. Yeah, a lot of stress, a lot of yep. different things. A lot of stress. Um, yeah, I think I I haven't seen the odds, but I would assume that it's I got him. Scott. I assume it's Scotty, Rory, Brooks in that order. Is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's got to be. Scotty was. Now I don't know how accurate this was when I looked at it, but like before Rory won the uh, yeah tournament, he Scotty was. Plus three hundred now, now it's plus four fifty. Rory's, Rory's six plus eight hundred, okay. and Brooks is fourteen hundred. So yeah. four and a half to one, eight to one, fourteen to one odds. Do you think Scotty is going to win again? He hasn't. He ha- he's technically still on his streak. If you don't count the the fact that he didn't play last week, and the last tournament he played was a doubles tournament. So I'm the- gonna say. Did he actually play in the? Did he play in the? I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh, he he is. You are right. I don't think actually. I think he didn't play in that because they what, said in the doubles one. Yeah, because he said he still have a win streak going. But he may have played. I'm not sure. Oh, I don't remember. I thought you had said Zurich, he did. But I, could I be thought. Wrong. I thought he. I don't know if he did or not. I don't know if he was already on paternity leave. But um, I'm going to say no. Just because you go home, you have that baby. It's just it. it not that he's going to be like not locked in because he's. Right. You know, someone was talking about, I read an interesting article about him just having, like, the perfect, you know, golf, work, family balance. Like, I mean, he he goes out there, he does give it his best effort, but it's like, when he's home, he's, you know, like, home with his family. They were saying, it's very Jack nicholas s. That's how Jack Nicholas was, yeah. and everybody else was like, Jack had a pretty good work-life balance, didn't really care about being liked by everybody. He didn't want to be on all the commercials. Like, you know, Scotty Shuffler doesn't want to be Ricky Fowler. He didn't want to be on 15 different yeah. commercials. So he's just kind of comfortable in his own skin and who is, and I think he'll play well. I just think off the layoff, it's probably going to be a little tougher to keep that momentum going. But dude, if he puts well, no one's going to fucking beat him. The problem is for the rest of the field that, you know, everybody's probably mad at Shane Lowry because Rory McIlroy had zero confidence and then he wins with Shane Lowry, who's just building him up the whole week. Like, what are you doing? Like, I have you behind me. Like, and they end up winning the tournament. Now Rory comes out, wins by five shots, and makes every putt he looks at from 40 feet, from 30 feet, from 20 feet. Made fucking everything. They so said at whole he's going to be tough to beat this week. Sorry, he said that whole 10, I, I saw it was like he had already made 108 feet of putts. Yeah, in and the he first made 10 several holes. more after that. I mean, it was crazy. So. We watched the end of it together. It was like, yeah, Z- I, what was Xander was, I know you said this already, but what, Xander was up two shots at hole seven, and by 14, he was down five. Yeah. It was like a seven-shot swing in, in seven holes. And Xander Shoffley is just a classic chicken shit. I mean, he just, <laughs> he gets a lead, and he plays not to lose it. He's like, I'm going to go out here and make pars and hope nobody makes birdies. I mean, I don't know. The worst strategy of all time against Rory McIlroy. He's making everything. So he goes up to, and he goes full-blown like, you know, like it's a U.S. Open. I'm going to hit fairways and greens and not even try to make birdies. Next thing you know, he's down five. Yeah. So. That was a big choke job. Yeah. And the shot that he actually ended up making eagle on on seven, he spent like 10 minutes over the ball waiting for the wind to change and hits one in there and it catches a slope, makes a putt. I mean, that's really the only good hole he kind of played all day he he didn't do much i i going into the tournament this week i'm sure he's one of the top five guys up there that win it it's the fourth odds if you bet him if you bet him to get top Top, five go ahead but he ain't gonna win that's what i bet him at the masters was to get in the top 10 like it's an automatic top 10 he's very consistent he's very boring i i don't think he's gonna win and then obviously just wouldn't surprise me if brooks 
um, you know, who's the PGA Championship king pretty much these days. Wouldn't be surprised if he did it. Obviously, I always root for Spieth in the PGA Championship because this is the one missing for the career Grand Slam. Yeah. He needs it for the slam. Which is so, weird because it's technically, you know, I know it, I know the course varies, but it's like supposedly the easiest one. An easier one to win. Yeah. Yeah, Spieth is better against, since Spieth doesn't hit it as far as those guys, he's typically better on the harder golf courses. Yeah. Scrambling, chipping, getting up and down. So and when, when the golf courses say maybe a little easier, it's not like U.S. Open rough or Lynx golf that he likes. It's kind of fits the guys like Rory that hit it. 9 million yards, and I it all depends to really what the rough looks like this week yeah. you know, out there. So it'll be interesting to see. It's always, majors are always fun. Is Valhalla a pretty tough course? Yeah, fairly, but it's not like, you know, it's not like going to Bethpage Black or like some of these courses where, where they're going to have the, I think Bethpage Black is U.S. or maybe, no, they're doing the Ryder Cup at Bethpage Black, I think is what it is. But yeah, anyway, there's some courses, you know, like, when they have the rough up or like borderline impossible, even for these pros, like they're going trying to hope to go out there and shoot even par. But I don't think I don't know what the winning score was last time Rory won there ten years ago. But I mean, it, the guys will be several under par. I mean, it's not going to be like even par wins right. it or anything. So like this that. course kind of plays to people who hit the ball far. I, I believe so. I yeah. mean, that's probably why Rory won it last right. time. I mean, I I'm not. Which is why him and Scotty, because they both hit the ball really far, right? Scotty hits it pretty far. Scotty hits it pretty good. Not as far as like the big bombers, but Scotty T to green or, you know, right from a approach, approach strokes gained with approach irons green is better than anybody by far. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be a fun tournament. We'll see if, uh, like I said, I would rather, I would rather Spieth win, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. On, uh, so I guess if I, if you had to give me one long shot outside of like the top five, who would you say is somebody who could win? Oh man, I would have to look at names. Like, read the names off the list. Yeah, hold on. Go to like. Uh, Let's see. Okay, we got. Obviously, we already said. Okay, John Rom, Xander Schauffele, Ludwig Ab- Aberg. Those. This is kind of like in order of the odds. Bryson DeChambeau, Colin Morikawa, Max Homa. We're in the Max Homa. We hit the thirty to one range. Uh, Joaquin Neiman, thirty three to one. Cam Smith, thirty five to one. Victor Hovland, thirty five to one. Patrick Cantlay, uh, Wyndham Clark, forty to one. Fleetwood, Justin Thomas. Give me Zalatoris, fifty five to one. Wow, coming Didn't coming he off almost, the, He's almost yeah. He played pretty five to one. Yeah, he played pretty good at the Masters, I think, and um, he did. He's almost won. I mean, he's been in the running he, for he several very majors. Well, yeah, yeah. should have won. I think in twenty twenty two against Justin Thomas, right? Yeah, Justin Thomas made that like was a crazy. The, that comeback. was the PGA Championship. Yeah. That was what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, because Meek uh, Pereira blew it on the last hole, and then they went to I think Justin Thomas had to go to a playoff. I believe to win, so right? too. Yeah, against Zalatoris and maybe one other guy. And I think but Justin yeah, Thomas wasn't even in the running for fun. There. Like a price over fifty to one Zalatoris. Is okay. a good one. Gotcha. Uh, let's see here. Oh, go ahead. I want to talk about NHL playoffs for a second. The West, we have the Stars, a 2 1 lead over the Avalanche after losing game one. They blew a 3 0 lead in game one, almost blew a 4 0 lead in game two in the third period, but hung on. One game three and now up 2 to 1. So both teams in the West after are up 2 to 1 after the Canucks kind of stunned the Oilers last night, 4 to 3, hung on to win. And in the East, we have both teams up three to one. The Florida Panthers are up three to yep. one on the Bruins, and then we have the Rangers up three to one on the Hurricanes. Give me your thoughts so far on, on what we've seen uh, in this, this round. Panthers just beating the shit out of the Bruins in series. They're out shooting them by like twenty shots. The only reason the Bruins had even won a game is because Swayman was crazy in that game. So Panthers come back to win three two last night, three one in the series. I think that's pretty much over. Then we go um, Rangers, Hurricanes. Hurricanes have actually outplayed the Rangers, I'd say, in the majority of the games. Um, their goalie for the Rangers has just been, I, I believe, uh, he won. he's won best goaltender at some point before a Russian kid. I always forget how to say his name, but very, very good goalie. He's stymied the Hurricanes like, and three games, and the Hurricanes have outshot them by 10. It, it's It's been the, and we've talked on this before, I've touched on it before, the playoff hockey is like, you got a hot goaltender, you go win the Stanley Cup. It's that simple. The Kings did it when they had Jonathan Quick back in the day when 
they were making their runs, and the Kings were not the best team in hockey. Jonathan yeah. Quick was just better than everybody else. Uh, last night, I believe the Oilers outshot the Canucks by 30 and lost 4-2. to two. That's crazy. The Canucks goalie made 42 saves. Like, standing on his head, just crazy. No, so, sorry. Uh, Oilers scored with a minute left to make it 4-3. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then even had one shot at the very end. I saw it. And it actually, one of the shots came just after the horn, and the goalie made a ridiculous save on it. It didn't let it go in. So, he's playing out of his mind. Vancouver's getting a Thoroughly outplayed. Yeah. But that's always been the knock on Edmund. Great team. Not a good defense. Goalies are no good. Yep. Stars, Avs, kind of the same thing. Ottinger's kind of uh, playing better for the Stars. Avs have been, obviously had the one comeback. It's been a pretty even series. Uh, the Stars probably outplayed them in the, the first two games besides blowing that lead. And then game three, funny enough, I think the Avs outshot them by 15 shots and, you know, Lost and shots aren't the only thing you go on, but they were they were pretty good shots. It yeah. wasn't like uh, just flipping pucks on net. So anyway, I think I said last week I was predicting the Avs and Panthers to go to the Stanley Cup. I'll stick with them. Avs are going to have to come back. Panthers look really good. I they they are making the Bruins. Didn't we see the? Weren't you like? Is that really the shots? Wasn't yeah, it, like, it was like four, twenty-seven to eleven in like the second. Period. Yeah, and then I think it, it ended ridiculous. up being like forty to seventeen or yeah. something. I mean, they were. Just dominating stupid, the game. So stupid. Goalies are yeah, keeping these teams keeping these teams alive. So we had the uh NCAA football video game. They they released the deluxe edition cover. Oh, okay. Not the official cover. The official cover is released on Thursday. But on the deluxe edition, it was like a bunch of guys. It was like one guy in the middle, which I believe was Donovan Edwards, the running back from Michigan. Oh yeah. Then it had on the side on the right side, I think Travis Hunter from Colorado, and then Quinn Ewers from Texas. You could kind of see uh like there's a few other guys. Like it's kind of a, a bunch of people walking out of a tunnel. And so it's kind of hard to see. But Jalen Milrow was one of them up in front of them. And then I'm trying to think who else was in front of them. It was like some of the others. Like, so are they going to have? Oh, you, Carson Beck from Georgia. Do you think they're going to have all? Are they going to have like an act? So if there if, it is right there, if you can't. Yeah. You can't see so it. do you think they're going to? Is that going to actually be the cover? Or are they going to have a? Yeah. So they're going to have like an actual cover athlete on. So is it going to be? Is it going to be Shadir Sanders? There's multiple in? cover athletes. Gotcha. So if they have those guys there, you got to think it's going to be Sh- Sanders. That's going to be the quarterback. on Probably it, right? Sanders. I could see that. Just to hype. Yeah. I mean, that's what I think. The running back will be. Oh, man. That's so stupid. It was Sanders just one player. Yeah. Like, I, I'm, so I'm guessing. Dumb. The reason I say that is he because they have sucks. Hunter up there now, right? Oh, I agree. There, so I, that's what they're going to do. I agree with you. I just think he sucks. I don't think he's great. When, the, the actual game itself isn't released till July, correct? When is the demo out? There is no demo. They don't do demos anymore. I'm, I'm, I have no idea how video games work anymore. By the way, I did download. I was just bored one night, and I downloaded Madden on my PS4, the newest Madden. I played one game. That is the worst piece of shit football game I've ever played. It's so bad. They need. I hope to God. They say this is supposed to be like its own video game, completely different from Madden. I pray that that's true because it always was. It always was different from Madden when they had the college football game, but... I mean, if they just copy the Madden game with this, I'm, it's going to be irritating because, right, you would think them taking this long to do it, it wasn't just negotiating the rights. It was them designing the game. So, like, you would think them taking this long to do it, it's going to have unique gameplay. I would hope. I, I don't I, I'm, I Madden's don't know. Madden's that bad, huh? I, it was pretty bad, dude. I don't know. Oh, I haven't played video games in years. It, it was, given, I only played one game. It was an exhibition game, but, like, all the controls are different than what they used to be. There was like weird ways of throwing it. It's like very generic animations. Even when you just pan over, like you're you think about like Madden and how much you think would go into that game, and like they're panning into the stadium, and it's like the same 2002 graphics of the cheerleaders doing like the same generic motion. Oh it's just, it's horrible. I won't play Ultimate Team on the college game. I'll it's only gotta play be the Road di- to Glory it's gotta and be Dynasty. The Dynasty mode deal that we using. have to do. We have to do. We got to get more people to do it. But we got to get like a, a, a online Dynasty and and like yeah, with the, either fun. with us and add some people or whatever. Like that's that's the that was the fun part of doing that game back in the day. You could do that. I'm assuming you can because that's the coolest part of that game. Yeah, yeah, 
You're only you you will only you only get the guys from you know the the rejects from Mississippi State and Tennessee. Uh, that'll be who you get for Vandy. Yeah. I'll take over. So so when we do do this, he gets Vandy. I get Texas. Who do you get? It'll just be Texas Tech. Texas Tech. There we go. That's good. Vandy, Texas, Texas Tech. That's good right there. I might have a little advantage, but you know that's fair. My my dynasty my dynasty mode. This is my dynasty world. I make the rules. Okay, <laughs> bitches. Y'all y'all don't get to talk. This is I'm my... sure Texas will be just as underachieving with you running them as they oh, are how in dare real life. You? How dare Oh, <laughs> as as you would say. Oh please. Oh, oh please. please. Oh please. Okay. Um. Let's see. Oh, oh love Bill Walton. Few. La- this might be the last topic. It, it's a it's a one I wanted to debate just to bring it up because it was a hot topic this week. Austin Rivers came out and made this comment on a podcast, and he said, 30 guys right now in the NBA could play in the NFL, but you could not take... I, I don't know if he said there was a number that could or none. I don't, maybe he said none. Maybe he said no NFL players could play in the NBA. And I just want to discuss this topic, and I want you to tell me if you believe that Austin Rivers is right. Obviously, a lot of NFL guys were upset about this. A lot yeah, of them yeah. clapped back at him. I saw this, and before I even knew that people were upset about it, I didn't know it was going to become a big deal. I said, I understand what he's saying, like the idea of what he's saying, but saying that 30 guys from the NBA could play in the NFL yeah. is wild. It's a 0% I, chance. 0% chance. Yeah. It's, he's idiotic. And I, I, went through, I went through the whole NBA last night, and I wrote down 15 guys just who I would even consider as like, okay, they have the athleticism to possibly play somewhere yeah. and the physicality. But not even incorporating the fact of toughness and like being able to play and sustain it. So like that part of it, I, I would say maybe there's three or four. Yeah, the reason it's just so dumb is because you have to once you get to the NFL, you have to play like a legitimate p- position, right? It, like it's not as like what are you gonna do? It's like I get what he's trying to say. There's 30 athletes that can go do it, but if he thinks he's one of them, he's Fucking! A dumb I don't ass. think he said. Okay. I because JJ but, Watt tweeted that out. He's like, "Are you gonna lose his play? mind?" He's yeah. like, "Oh, you, you play, fucking buddy? bitch! You couldn't." <laughs> and then he had he like actually tweeted an apology. I was like, "I misread the headline. It. I didn't realize you were just saying thirty players. You didn't include yourself. Oh yeah, yeah. Because yeah. a lot of people were like, you 'You're a fucking bitch.' No, I get what he. Yeah, uh, I kind of get what he's trying to say as far as there's athletes that could do that. But yes, there's definitely there's definitely as many athletes that could play in the NBA that are in the NFL. It takes, in my opinion, because in basketball, there's there's two guys on the floor typically in basketball that don't even score anyway, right? Like, it's not, but whatever. Like, they might be able to lay the ball in one guy, one guy typically. Back in the day, I would say yes. But there's several guys, in my opinion. Now, they couldn't be effective in the NBA by any stretch. But if you threw them in the NBA, like, I'm trying to think of an example here. Like, a guy that could be a... um, like a really, really talented defensive end. So let's go with like, um, I don't know, one of the Boses. I guarantee you at six foot eight, I mean, I don't know how big they are. Or someone that's a big tight end, a big tight end. Typically it's the tight ends that aren't as good as ba- at basketball that go eventually play football. The whole point is I think either way, when you look at it, there's no one that could really play in either because it's far more – you know, advanced yeah. than just, hey, you can you can check it and play. All I'm saying is, from a defensive standpoint, if you get athletes from the NFL to just try to play defense and stay in front of somebody dribbling the ball, they have a better chance than putting an NBA player in and trying to run the ball between I the agree, tackles. I agree NFL. with that. I That's what I'm that. saying. But now, I don't think either of them, none of them would be effective in any stretch. The NBA, they would go right around the guys and score. All I'm saying is there are some freak athletes in the NBA that you can put down in the low block or something to grab rebounds and well, stuff. That's all I would here's say. Here's what I would say. Like, Again, in, in reality, I think it's like I agree. I think it's probably zero. Yeah. But like, if you take like LeBron in his prime, oh yeah, and he's not a pussy. Like, right. Yeah. So if you take out the fact of like, would he be willing to take hits? Same with Zion Williamson. Like, yeah. take injuries out. Those guys legitimately could play in the NFL. Those are the two that I would say. Like, okay, if you put LeBron James at defensive end or tight end or you know, that's probably the two he could play. Maybe wide receiver. Um, even though that's a big wide receiver right there. Yeah. He'd probably get hit pretty hard below. Zion Williamson wouldn't last five minutes because he'd get injured, but you could put him at fucking defensive end or 
you know, I don't know what his whatever, size, yeah. maybe defensive tackle if he was bigger, a little bit fatter, like if he tried to become a football whatever, player, yeah. whatever. Those would be the two, maybe. The only thing, and, and I agree, the only thing I would say, and, and I agree with what you're saying, like from a defensive standpoint, absolutely. I think like, okay, if you're like, hey, could you put this guy in an NBA game and like, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. No, no, I don't. I think the only difference is I think you look at, I was trying to go through guys who have done, like done it, like, it, it's more likely, I would say, for a guy to play, to not play college football and to play in the NFL than it is for, to not play college basketball and play in the NBA. Agree with that. That's, what, that's the only thing I would say. Also, because there's five guys on the floor at the time, there's only 12 exactly. men on the roster. But also, you could run down the field. Like, there's some guys that play NBA that could run down the field and perhaps make a tackle. Right. But it, I just think both sides, like we both agree, would just be non existent, right. non effective. No, it would be non Now, LeBron James in his prime, of course, everybody's thought that, like, dude, if you put that guy at tight end, right. which he did. Well, of course, he's one of the greatest athletes probably to ever live as far as doing anything. So I'm sure he could do it. But then you have guys. But then I, I'll also say, like, not that they want to, but I find it hard to believe that guys that are just freak athletes like Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase. Like, if they played basketball growing up and played a little in high well, school yeah, that's in different. two years, like, and all they did was play basketball – I think that they could be a 12th man on a team or something like maybe, that. Maybe. I don't know. It's maybe all a 12th it's a man, stupid fucking argument. It is a stupid neither argument. one of them would but, do anything. No, but I do think like, like again, you look at it. The only guy I could find that ever, and I actually don't know. Did Charlie Ward play college basketball or did he only play football? Mm, I don't know. See, if he, he would be the only one who, if he didn't play college basketball, he went from not playing college basketball and being a football player to going to the NBA, and he was a he was an average pro. Funny enough, they say um, don't know if this is true. A lot of people think Nick Foles could have played either in Europe or like in the NBA. Like he was legitimately. Good. I, I, Tony he's Romo good, was yeah. real good as yeah. well. And, I mean, and, Foles, but Foles is what six foot yeah. six. I mean, yeah. he's a big guy. He's probably more of a European. But yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, like well, not a freak but athlete. Then you but then you look they at said he could really play. Yeah, but then you look at guys like Antonio Gates never played football and played basketball only in yeah. college and then was a, a Hall of Fame NFL yeah. player. Jimmy Graham played one season of football and played four seasons of basketball at Miami. St- tied in. Rico Gathers only played 15, 15 games in the NFL but was a college basketball player and went and played Yeah, The NFL. only position they really can move you to is like tied, a tight end. Tied in, That's yeah. like it. But, but I yeah, agree. It's there's a not 30 argument. guys that can do that. No, yeah. and Austin Rivers is actually an idiot and I loved hearing James Jones the receiver from the Packers, like you're yeah, just shitting on him and be like, "You're a bum." If my if my daddy played in the NBA and was the coach, I could be a top ten draft pick too. Like <laughs> Austin Rivers is the biggest example of nepotism that professional sports has ever seen. That guy deserved to be in the league for about two seasons just because he had a decent college career. He would have been drafted in like the late first or second round if his last name wasn't Rivers, and he would have lasted two to three years in the NBA. He got a nine or ten year career, and he was talking shit after averaging like six points a game over his career. He's a bitch. I don't like Austin yeah. Rivers at all. Even Charles Barkley was like, I like you, Austin Rivers, but you need to shut up. Like, yeah, none of us could do that. this. Shut up. Like, Shark's stop like, talking. Yeah, we could. Yeah, yeah we could. He's, He's like, like, no, we could. Like, right like, I'll tackle you right now. Yeah. I'll tackle you right now. I mean, now Shaq is another guy that I'm like, Shaq's so fucking big. He could have played in the yeah, NFL. That's, that's a complete different, different story. Different He's story. just a... Yeah, giant of a man. But yeah, I think everybody, I, all the crossover people would be pretty much worthless. You'd find like, like you said, three guys in 30 years, like, you know, that could play tight end that yeah. ended up being serviceable. So, yeah. or good, good tight ends. I mean, obviously, Tony Gonzalez was one too, which I think he played basketball. Yeah, we got to get out of here. But I want to mention one last, not, not to debate it, but just, did you see that Malik Neighbors and Jaden Daniels had a $10,000 bet on the rookie of the year and then they had to fucking cancel it because of the... I mean, how ridiculous is that? Yeah. I mean, like, oh, it's a, you can't have a gambling fucking, uh, you can't have a, a bet on who's going to win. How is that How is that against the policy of the NFL to, like, place a bet with a bookie? You're placing a bet with a friend. You're telling me I can't say, like, I'm hey, be I'll bet you a dinner. Uh, yeah, or I'll bet you a dinner or whatever. Like, maybe the fact that it was cash, but it's stupid. No, it's they so could do dumb. a dinner, I guess. It's all Come stupid. Come on, it's so ridiculous. Just to be rookie of the year. I mean, it's like, that's all they're, they're not arguing about whose team's going to win more. They're just like, hey, I'm going to be rookie of the year. You're yeah. Not. 
I yeah. Mean, yeah, I mean, it's like they're trying to be. It's a, it's a friendly competition. And frankly, being neither one of them will probably be rookie of the no. year because uh, everybody wants to give it to Caleb Williams, and Caleb Williams has three times the talent both those guys have on their team. So. And if it was between neighbors and and Daniels, yeah, yeah. and and if you're gonna if a receiver is gonna win, it, it's gonna be Marvin Harrison Jr. anyway. Yeah. So it's just stupid, stupid argument. But stupid, anyway, yep. All right, that's it for this podcast today, Monday, May thirteenth. We'll be back next week. We actually do have some guests coming on. We'll have a, a short interview next week with some of the guys, some some college football players coming oh, on the cool. podcast. So we'll do oh, a thank God. We'll do a, a yeah. yay football. Yeah, we're so close. There you go. There you go. I, 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 it's a we treat have a long. We got a long way to go. How to dangle a carrot out there? I was telling, I was telling engaged. my brother the other day at my niece's softball game, like. Oh, it's gonna be so great when college football is on again on Saturday. She's like, "Yeah, you've got a long way to go, though." Like, like, yeah, I know. It's like he's on his Notre Dame recruiting boards all the time, looking at stuff. He's gonna come on at some point. He's yeah, excited. We gotta get him on the podcast. He's we a, also he's a lunatic. We also are. We started. I started a new gambling channel, which we're gonna start releasing content coming up soon. We're gonna do some conference and, and team previews for the the coming season. We'll do like an SEC preview, a Big Twelve preview. Big 10 preview, all that stuff. Vanderbilt preview. Vanderbilt team preview for Bailey. <laughs> Bailey's getting a mic next week after the interview concludes with those two guys. It'll be a 30-minute yes. segment on just Bailey talking about I really about like football. what we're doing, this offensive yeah. tackle out of Michigan. <laughs> Park Ranger Plex really will, like will give his take take on, on Vanderbilt football. What? Oh, of course, he was he was you know commenting back at your, your making fun of their tackles. But all right. Make sure to like and subscribe. If you watched all the way through, which is not a lot of you, make sure, please leave us a comment. It helps us a lot. Hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll be back talking NBA playoffs. We'll have some interesting guests from a couple a couple college football, a TCU offensive lineman coming on the show next week. And then we got a, a Baylor offensive lineman who was a is a former All-American, high school All-American, coming on in a couple weeks as well. We're not sure if that's going to be in-person or virtual yet, but got a lot of cool guests coming to you soon. We're, we're working on getting some other guys on here, but make sure to like and subscribe. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for supporting the podcast. Leave us a comment and tell us that we sucked or that we're great or whatever, and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you guys next week.